Hello and welcome to Podcast.net, the podcast about Python and the people who make it great. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or add our RSS feed to your podcatcher of choice. You can also follow us on Twitter or Google+, and please give us feedback. You can leave a review on iTunes to help other people find the show, send us a tweet or an email, leave us a message on Google+, or on our show notes, and you can also join our new community. Visit discourse.pythonpodcast.com for your opportunity to find out about upcoming guests, suggest questions, and propose show ideas. I would like to thank everyone who has donated to the show. Your contributions help us make the show sustainable. For details on how to support the show, you can visit our site at pythonpodcast.com. Linode is sponsoring us this week. Check them out at linode.com slash podcastinit and get a $20 credit to try out their fast and reliable Linux virtual servers for your next project. I would also like to thank Hired, a job marketplace for developers and designers, for sponsoring this episode of Podcast.init. Use the link hired.com slash podcastinit to double your signing bonus. Your host today is Tobias Macy, and today I'm interviewing Matthew Rocklin and Alexander Shepanovsky about their work on functional libraries for Python. So, could you guys please introduce yourselves? How about you go first, Alexander? Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Alexander Shepanovsky, <laughs> and I am a Python programmer, and open source author and talks giver. <laughs> okay. All right. And how about you, Matthew? Hi, everyone. Uh, first, thanks for having me on the show. My name is Matthew Rocklin. I'm a full-time open source developer at Continuum Analytics. I usually develop in sort of the numeric Python stack, so all libraries that run on top of NumPy and Pandas. Uh, previously, I did research in numerical methods and usability. And how did you each get introduced to Python? How about you go again, Alexander? Yeah, we can see a difference between uh, me and Matthew. So I came from uh, web development and uh, Matthew from uh, numeric programming, and I think this will uh, influence <laughs> the rest of our uh, podcast. So it was, uh, I believe, uh, 2007, uh, and uh, we we were using uh, Perl back then, and uh, we were using our own kind of uh, framework, and. Uh, I decided that uh, we need to move on and uh, use uh, uh, some something, some fra framework, uh, some open source framework. And I looked around, uh, and there were only uh, old things in uh, Perl. So I looked more around, and it was uh, a choice at the, at the time between Django and uh, uh, Ruby on Rails. Not really a, a choice even between languages, but between frameworks. And uh, even though uh, Ruby seemed more interesting, uh, Rails seemed uh, too dirty. Like uh, the last uh, thing was uh, that they are passing all the local variables from this, what we call controller, to a t template. And uh, so uh, I went with uh, Django and uh, was introduced to Python. And how about you, Matthew? How did you find Python? Uh, yeah, so I actually picked it up in graduate school. Uh, previously, I just during coursework. Uh, previously, I used C Sharp for software engineering and MATLAB for more data analysis and science work. Uh, particularly, I used MATLAB because it sort of had all the data science things for me, and also because my science collaborators, you know, physicists, not computer scientists, uh, could understand it. Uh, I sort of picked up Python just doing coursework, just as a, as a fun side project, and I was sort of very happily surprised to learn that it could do both software engineering and it had the API that a, a data science user could use. Uh, so I could build tools and share them with my science collaborators. And that sort of combination really, uh, really stuck with me. So that was sort of my, why I jumped into it and I just haven't left since. Uh, to reiterate uh, Alexander's point about two different communities, I think it's a very valid, valid point that People come into Python from a lot of different, lot of different perspectives, and we have, you know, we make different software. Sometimes it doesn't work well together. Uh, and very recently, it's been very exciting actually to see the web community and the data science community start to come together. So, you know, most scientists that I know now use Flask as sort of this like accessible thing, um, and a lot of the web developers I know are now using some of the more visual uh, tools for visualization inside of the data science world. So again, it's very cool to see these two communities coming together. Um, Although in some cases, like with the case of Alexander and I, we've um, 
you've duplicated some efforts. This is not necessarily a bad thing. <laughs> Absolutely not. No, it's great. And can you guys first explain what functional programming is and how it differs from the procedural or object-oriented programming that most Pythonistas are familiar with? And recognizing that functional programming is kind of an overloaded term with a lot of subcomponents, so feel free to delve into that as well. I don't think you should oppose functional programming and uh, procedural or object-oriented one. Uh, you should oppose functional programming and Im imperative. So in imperative programming, you, uh, and the difference is in uh, how you think about your program and how you decompose it. In imperative programming, you uh, think uh, of a program as an algorithm, which is a series of steps. So d you decompose it in into, into steps, which uh, change the state of a world. And in, in functional programming, you think of a program as a function. So it's you have input and output and some uh, this transformation from one to, to seconds. And uh, you decompose it into a simpler function by using function composition and things like that. So in imperative programming, if you get some steps and you unite them, you get a procedural programming. And uh, then if you add objects, you get a object-oriented programming. But these are like add-ons uh, on imperative programming. And uh, in functional programming, it's usually associated with things like pure functions, monads, and higher order functions, and things like that. But these are only uh, with the consequences of uh, the way of thinking about a program and a way of decomposing it. Because uh, when you start to decompose your big function to smaller functions, you start to see that uh, not functions uh, are equally easy to decompose to. So it's easier to decompose to pure functions and uh, things like that. And uh, you when want to make uh, to give special special attention to side effects and probably separate side effects from the rest of calculation. And, uh, so all these things that are usually associated with functional programming with are just consequences of the idea of functional programming. So this is my understanding. Yeah, so I have a. I think that's a great definition. I think that many developers will have different understanding of this of this term. I think a Haskell developer and a Clojure developer will, will think about what functional programming is a little bit differently. Um, but I think the definition provided by Alex is, Alexander is, is great. Uh, how I would define it actually is more of a historical definition. I would say that uh, functional programming is a set of language features uh, that come from languages that, that descend from two root languages. Uh, Lisp that originated around the same time as Fortran and Algol, and ML, uh, sort of a, an academic uh, language to prove uh, theorems about type systems that originated in the 1970s. Uh, Lisp begat languages like Common Lisp and Clojure, and ML begat languages like Haskell. And I would say that these languages have a lot of language features, as all languages do, and the language features that appeared only in these languages, but not in the sort of C and Fortran-like languages that we're more familiar with, all of those features sort of tend to be called functional. So this might be function composition, functions as data, higher order functions, uh, but also things like macros or algebraic type systems, uh, sort of more fancy things, or more pedestrian things like streaming iterators and, and a strong reliance on core data structures. Today, I would say that people often use the term functional programming just as a reaction to highly imperative or object-oriented programming. Um, there's sort of this push towards simplicity. So when I read blog posts, I sort of I get a, a variety of there's a variety of terms that all seem to be lumped into this term of functional programming. And if it's a Haskell programmer, it might be talking about algebraic type systems. If it's a Clojure programmer, it might be talking about macros. Um, and so there's a there's a large grab bag of of concepts here. And how did you each get started with functional programming? Uh, for me, it's uh, not like you you start with, you don't start with functional programming. At first, because you don't know what functional programming is. But uh, you start thinking uh, in a functional way sometimes. And, and uh, you probably got introduced to some concept like pure fun function or high order functions. And uh, you can see uh, a practical advantage of, for example, high order functions because you uh, can 
write functions which are more cust customizable this way. And uh, it uh, could be easier when writing objects. You have less parts or less code. And like uh, like this, you get introduced to these concepts or and not only concepts, but uh, the specifics, uh, the application. Then I, uh, I also got introduced to Common Lisp. <laughs> I never actually used it for anything uh, practical, but it was uh, just played with it and uh, extracted some uh, ideas from it. So this is my story with functional programming. I, I later took a, a look into ML and Haskell, and I don't think uh, that much practical, especially Haskell. It uh, has too much hassle in it. I think there are a lot of Haskell developers that would disagree with that, but I, I, I also agree with you. Yeah, even if you have less code, it uh, not always uh, means uh, you spend uh, less time writing it and uh, anybody else will spend less time reading it and understanding it or modifying this code. It's a uh, very huge amount of hustle with many things in Haskell, like I.O. <laughs> okay. Matthew, how'd you get involved in functional programming? Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, like Alexander, I, I probably started learning functional concepts before I really identified them as being functional concepts. I think that was a really great point. Uh, when I sort of intentionally started learning functional programming, it was actually a social activity. A couple of my friends, Avi Newman, John Jacobson, and I wanted to get together and drink some beers. We wanted some activity to do. And so we decided to uh, implement the same problem. It was a, like a job interview problem in a variety of languages. Uh, so we did it in C and in Fortran and in Clojure and in Haskell and in languages like Maud. Um, and it was actually really interesting to see uh, what, what about our solutions was intrinsic to the problem that would stay the same across all these languages? And what about our solutions was sort of a side effect of the language? Um, and it was just a really fascinating experience. I highly recommend grabbing a couple of programming friends and doing the same thing, uh, especially if they're in different disciplines. Uh, neither Avi, John, or I uh, had a common background. Uh, John Jacobson in particular was quite keen on closure, and he sort of brought us in that direction. And as a result, I sort of screwed on the closure for the following year, and that had a really strong impact on my programming style, even today. I don't think I've ever used functional programming in, I've never used a strictly functional language uh, in practice, uh, but I took a lot, of this, a lot of the ideas that I learned from delving into functional programming into my everyday Python code. And I think there's really a lot of value to functional programming, even if you're not doing it explicitly, or if you're not you know, in Haskell or in Clojure, uh, you can still use a lot of the, a lot of the concepts uh, in everyday everyday style. And we've touched on it a bit, but what are some of the benefits of functional programming and when might somebody want to use functional paradigms in their projects? I may first add a small remark on uh, writing, mm, writing the same thing in different languages. There is a resource uh, called, uh, called Rosetta Code. It's mm -hmm. a wiki with a, a solution in different languages for different problems. Could be, and could be quite interesting to look sometimes. And about the benefits on functional programming. For me, it's uh, like you you can uh, uh, use this customization with uh, which uh, high order functions give you without uh, the unneeded layer of like classes. Classes and factories and things like that. You can achieve in object-oriented paradigm, but it's usually more hassle. Uh, when also if you think uh, not about uh, concrete uh, specific features, but about uh, thinking, uh, it uh, could also be beneficial because the alternative is usually imperative programming where you think of steps. And uh, in functional programming, you think of uh, operations and uh, you think of data and you think of operations which you apply to it. And uh, it uh, could be a higher level of thinking. So you might compress bigger algorithm to fit into your mind. This could be pro this is probably the highest benefit. But uh, different uh, features uh, could also be beneficial. Yeah, so I totally agree with um, how functional programming lets you decompose a problem into functions that are pure and have clean inputs and outputs, and how uh, we can solve most problems using just simple data structures and functions that call each other and have very dependable inputs and outputs. Uh, I would I generally classify this under the concept of modularity. Uh, and I would say that if we had a more object-oriented person on, on the phone, they might also say that object-oriented programming uh, also enables modularity. It also enables people to break down large problems into small problems. 
Uh, I think the difference comes in uh, the style in which one achieves that. Uh, so I think that functional programming, there's maybe a tenant that uh, you don't need an object, which is this marriage of state and functions. And that often state and functions can live separately, and that's often sufficient. So I think you can actually solve a large number of problems, very hard problems, uh, using just core data structures like lists and dictionaries and strings and numbers and simple functions. Um, I think a lot of functional programming, a lot of the resurgence recently has come out of sort of a, a, a backlash or a reaction to the sort of heavy object-oriented programming that came out of the 90s. Uh, would you agree? What are your thoughts, Alexander? I can add to it uh, that when you model your domain with in object-oriented way, usually create with uh, types which mm -hmm. represent some uh, data. And uh, when this is uh, always a, a new class, it's new types, so you need to implement lots of operations to handle them. Right. But if you model your data with uh, some uh, data structures like uh, dicts, lists, and so on, uh, you already have lots of uh, operation in language for them. So usually it's, it's less cold and uh, it's faster to model things. Yeah, and in addition, not only is your code simpler, but your code can more easily interact with other code that you didn't anticipate. For example, you know, if I just use dictionaries and lists, I can use the JSON library immediately, trivially, without having to think about writing a to JSON method. I think Rich Hickey has a good example here of the uh, uh, of the HTTP request object in most languages. It's usually some object that has lots of sub-objects, and if you want to interact with an HTTP request object, you sort of need to have the documents side by side as you're walking through this object. While instead it could just be a nested uh, dictionary. Uh, and then I could you know, pull requests off of some socket. I could dump them into a document store like MongoDB, or I could serialize and put them to disk, uh, all without having to write any extra code to handle those interfaces. So I think one major feature of functional programming is just a reliance on shared abstractions that are common to language uh, core data structures. Uh, but I think that there are also some other features that are also associated to functional languages that are still also valuable. Like algebraic types are something that you know, came out of ML and help compilers ensure correctness and improve speed. And these you know, might be sort of strange if you're looking at it from Haskell, but if you look at a newer language like Julia, it's very accessible, and they've used algebraic types very effectively to improve performance. Something like macros, which came out of Lisp, uh, can help library developers make more powerful user APIs. Uh, and this is something that's been very helpful in, say, the language R, uh, which uses them to make very powerful user APIs, uh, even if they're a little bit strange for developers. Uh, you know, immutability is something that's often referred to as a functional uh, concept, uh, and software transactional memory. And they really help with concurrency. And these are there's lots of immutable data structures inside of Python or inside of external libraries within Python. And software transactional memory has recently been added to PyPy. Uh, so there's lots of ideas that are come from these languages that are that are still useful. Uh, in a variety of different contexts. Yeah, and uh, we have progress in uh, things like that, and uh, I can see little progress in uh, object-oriented programming. You may have alluded to it a bit earlier, but what is it about functional programming that people find so intimidating, and what do you think has led to its recent rise in popularity? Mm, so intimidating? <laughs> it's uh, not that much intimidating if you don't tell people that this is functional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And say uh, you don't need to. Uh, in uh, if uh, I go a bit aside, sure. Uh, when you uh, market like a functional sub, uh, functional programming support library for a language, uh, you could uh, say like uh, so stop uh, doing like that and uh, r write uh, code this way and use my library. And this is a very weak proposition. Uh, or you can uh, have some utils which. Uh, actually solve uh, problems that uh, people have, like uh, some utils with, uh, to work with sequences and uh, utils uh, to work with collections and uh, like that. And then uh, you say, my, this my util utils, they are very customizable because uh, uh, they accept functions. So they are high order functions which accept functions. So you can uh, use them for many tasks with your sequences or collections. And uh, this way you're solving uh, some problems, some problems people already have. And uh, this way people can Google your library and uh, Google it by Googling their problems, not Googling uh, functional programming in Python, which uh, I think uh, far 
less people do. And uh, when people start uh, using these uh, utilities for sequences and collections, uh, we start, we start uh, thinking of how we were formed with utilities, which are high order functions. And uh, we start to look around in your library and uh, maybe introduce to other concepts like function composition. Uh, so it uh, should not be really intimidating. And so back to why is, why is it, uh, besides its name, I think uh, any anything that uh, not people not used to could be intimidating. Also, we have this uh, thing that you can pack lots of things on single line, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, people abuse it, and uh, this makes the co code uh, unreadable, especially for people who are not used to things like that. This could be intimidating. Also, uh, some features like monads could be intimidating because. It's really hard to explain why do you need those because you don't need those in most languages. And so this is my take. Maybe Matthew can add more. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with uh, the right way to brand functional programming and how, uh, the, again, the conversation isn't functional or not functional. It's um, here's, here's good ways to write software and, and less good ways to write software. And that's really where we should be focusing if we want to have a... a want to be pragmatic if you want to have a positive effect. I would say that I think everyone learned some derivative of C historically. And so if you knew a functional language, it was usually your second language. And as a result, it felt a little bit fringe or elite. Um, and this, this impression of it being elite, I think, was, was very damaging to the ideas within functional programming. I mean, I think even within the, the core Python community, there's still a little bit of hesitancy about any concept that's, that's called functional uh, because of this, this bad history. Um, but in truth, I think a lot of the concepts uh, of functional programming are actually much simpler than people think. Uh, for example, I think that macros, which are maybe a little bit strange to people, are simpler intrinsically than, say, class inheritance in object-oriented programming. However, I say recently, so you asked about uh, the recent rise in popularity. And I would say that recently there's been some hardware changes, like multi-core architectures have brought on parallel computing. And there's been a lot of uh, need around highly concurrent systems. And for these, the uh, fully stateful model of, of imperative programming and mutation and state and object-oriented uh, aren't particularly ideal. Uh, and so uh, sort of the functional language community was sort of off in the side, this very small minority saying, hey, we've actually got all of these nice tools that are really well suited to handle uh, parallelism and concurrency and the building of large systems. Uh, and that really, that utility, that pragmatism, really helped to reverse public opinion. And so I think there's now maybe a sort of a revitalization of functional thinking to the point where most modern languages coming out now include a decently large subset of functional concepts within them. Uh, and this, this really makes those concepts much more accessible to single language developers. The fact that in Python, you can use functions as data or you can use higher order functions uh, and that's accessible to someone who's just learning programming is, is really powerful, I think. Yeah, and I think too that part of it might be attributable to the recent rise in popularity of JavaScript because while it does have some object-oriented capabilities, it's generally used more in a functional aspect of passing functions around as variables and as data. And also, you know, there's there's a new generation of developers coming up, and as you said, you know, a number of developers started with some variant of the C programming language and therefore so a lot of the functional principles are a little bit more foreign but given that there has been a slight rise in function in the popularity of functional languages like you said because of the recent changes in CPU architectures then the newer programmers who are getting started don't necessarily have that same shared history and are a little bit more willing to experiment and uh, also going back a little bit to what you were saying about functional paradigms being not as um, not as widely advertised or encouraged in Python. Uh, one thing that I've seen in a number of places, both in some of the official documentation and also in some company style guides is, for instance, avoiding the use of the map, filter, and reduce functions in favor of uh, list or dictionary comprehensions. And one thing that it seems it seems that in some respects that might be a disservice because I haven't tried it specifically, but it seems to me that the uh, comprehensions wouldn't necessarily be as composable as some of the like map and reduce functionality that are more intended to be a uh, that are that are more intended to be used in a functional approach. 
I'm actually totally fine uh, making map and filter a little bit uh, forbidden. The way I think of it, I think I'm going to steal some ideas that Alexander has spoken about. But think of all the ways that you use a for loop. Right? You might use a for loop to apply some function onto some lists, or you might use a for loop to uh, filter some list by some predicate, or you might use a for loop to reduce some list to some single number, like a sum. And if you're familiar with map and filter, you realize that you know 70% of your use, use cases of for loops fall into the cases of map, filter, or reduce. And so I think that map and filter are strictly better than a for loop, but uh, the core language designers recognized this and they elevated these common patterns to, to syntax, to the level of syntax. They elevate it to the list comprehension. And when you get up to that level, that's, that's even one step better than map and filter. I think that if, map and fil if list comprehensions didn't exist, map and filter would be very, very useful. But because list comprehensions do exist, uh, they're not so much necessary. I think what uh, libraries like what Funka, like Funky and Tools both provide is they provide a bunch of other functions like map and filter that do the same sorts of things. They represent common patterns that people use, uh, but that haven't yet been elevated to the level of syntax. So I would say, yes, don't use map and filter, use list comprehensions. They're usually more readable, but map and filter have cousins, and maybe it's good to look at those cousins. Uh, I think uh, both map filter and uh, comprehensions are fine. Uh, the usual, the usual reason to limit uh, use of uh, some functions or some language constructs is uh, to make your code base more more simple, like uh, less uh, features in it. Mm -hmm. So it uh, it could lead uh, to less errors if you have this uh, code style, but uh, for me, both is fine. Regarding uh, and uh, when you go from uh, map and filter, which are special purpose uh, to this uh, list or other comprehensions, they are more general purpose. So this is a try to go from uh, some specific solutions to uh, DSL. And uh, they have uh, overlaps in what we provide. But uh, I think uh, you have st you still have uh, usage for filter and for map. Yeah, I really like that idea, actually. Um, map and filter are good at uh, giving a name to a common pattern. Uh, and so even if you use list comprehensions or use for loops, it's nice to have that name. Oh, I'm doing a map now. And map and filter, as you say, are, are more explicit than our list comprehension. Sometimes you can also use a partial of map and or filter, but <laughs> this doesn't work with uh, comprehensions. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's part of what I was thinking of in terms of the composability where map and filter are a little bit superior in that respect. Um, but like you said, Matthew, the in a lot of cases, the comprehensions can be more immediately readable and clear as to what they're trying to do. But also, there are cases where you can get a little carried away using comprehensions, where, for instance, you're trying to do two or three different levels of filtering within one comprehension. And then then it might be make more sense to either compose those comprehensions together and nest them a bit, or to actually take advantage of the explicit filter call as Alexander was describing. I actually think uh, comprehension language uh, could be expanded. Like uh, the most uh, thing I miss is uh, let in comprehensions. Ah. Yeah, when you assign something and then use it later in if or... That would be very helpful, I agree. Yeah, because uh, now sometimes you need to just uh, duplicate an expression. For example, in if and in uh, exp an expression itself be before the for. And uh, in the common list, for example, we have a very, very complicated loop macro. Which, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, you, you heard about it. And uh, it uh, does not look like uh, the rest of the language, but uh, it uh, and uh, it's uh, it is 
causes contradictions. So some people hate it, but uh, for many people it's very handy because you can make lots of and lots of things with it. And you can uh, do map and filter and uh, aggregations and do several things at once. And in Python, you sometimes need to fall back to common four, because if you want to do several things at once, then this is usually the most efficient and sometimes the only way. And so we've done a pretty good coverage of list comprehensions. What other aspects of the Python language lend themselves to being used in a functional manner and where do they start to fall down? Maybe the most noticeable is the absence of special immutable data structures. But uh, you you can usually be okay with like immutable by convention, which is uh, not very efficient, but uh, works. And you can mess it up also, <laughs> but, but still. Yeah, so I would say that Python actually has a pretty good functional core. I mean, think ideas like streaming iterators, functions as data, functions as first class objects, uh, really good core data structures. Uh, there's the legacy things like uh, Lambda, Map, and Filter, uh, but higher order functions generally. These are all functional ideas that are really common in Python and that Python programmers do a very good job of using in common style. Uh, so it, to a large extent, Python is a functional language. Uh, there are some things that, doesn't, that Python doesn't do, uh, like, as Alexander was say, saying, immutable data structures. Although well, there's actually been some good work in this. There's, I think, uh, fn.py has some uh, persistent data structures with structural sharing. Uh, Kurt Smith has a project called Ozymandias, where he's implementing persistent data structures uh, at the C level, actually, using Cython. And they're very efficient. It's still a work in progress, but it's a fun project. Um, some things that I would love to see is... Um, better type systems. And there seems to be some push on this in Python 3.5. That's where the type module is coming out. Not doing anything yet, but it's still present. Um, and macros. I'd actually really love to see macros. As someone who builds user APIs, I would love to see macros. There's actually a Python library that I came across recently where the that, that, that does provide some macro capabilities. So I'll see if I can find the link and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. There are actually a couple of good ones. There's MacroPy, uh, and there's also Code Transformer by Scott Sanderson and Joe Devnick at Quantopian. Uh, these both do really cool things. Uh, they're they're manipulating the bytecodes. They're doing lots of cool things. Um, nothing will ever work without core language functionality in the interpreter. Most of my users are actually using the Python interpreter or like IPython or the Jupyter Notebook, um, and it's really hard to provide macros uh, without some kind of import hook. Or some kind of decorator. Yeah. Um, there's also, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but the High Laying Project, which yeah, is high a... Yeah, Yes. We, we had them on in a previous episode. And anyway, the, the, the project creator uh, was describing how he was able to backport some of the Python 3 capabilities to Python 2 using macros that he... Uh, it, it was the yield from operator that he backported from Python 3 using, high, using a high macro. <laughs> But yes, like you said, it does require some level of import to be able to inject that into the interpreter. I also have a point on macros. Uh, and it's a contradictory one because uh, it's uh, very fascinating to to have this opportunity to extend the language. But uh, this is a very dangerous one. Uh, if you add your macros to a language, you get this danger of uh, degenerating into this language into some dialects. So some people will st start using some macros and uh, other people other ones, and when we don't just understand each other, we can't read each other's co code. It uh, happens uh, more with uh, smaller languages uh, like Scheme, when you have a small language and when you so you guys can build on it with macros. Uh, but uh, for languages like Python, it uh, could also be dangerous. Uh, the other alternative is that uh, you don't use much macros. Uh, 
like you have them, but uh, you it's you should be very cautious about using them. And uh, I think in a common lisp and in closure, we're a bit adopting it. Yeah, I think that's a totally valid point. And macros are definitely a language feature that can destroy a language because it provides too much power to library developers to separate themselves into their own domain-specific language. And along with macros, you must include some sort of community standard that you should never use a macro unless absolutely necessary. Uh, I think if you look at, again, languages like Clojure or Julia, uh, this has become the norm. Uh, very few people use macros. It's considered to be a faux pas. Um, so yeah, and also you could also say that you know Python provides lots of opportunities for us to segment ourselves. There's lots of you know very you know say too powerful ideas in Python like meta classes that uh, that enable this sort of bad behavior already. And monkey patching. And monkey patching. Yeah, where Python is very permissive in lots of ways. This is a way it's not permissive. But as a library writer who serves uh, user scientific user communities, it's something I look at R, I look at Julia, and I. I just really want the ability to write macros because there's there's certain APIs that users love that are just impossible to write without uh, language support for macros. Uh, but I agree, you know, I only want sort of ten people in the world to, be able to write Python macros. Everyone else not allowed. Um, <laughs> and so, can you each describe what your respective libraries provide in terms of functional capabilities and what their particular focuses are? And also wondering if they're distinct enough from each other that it would make sense to use them both in a single project. Uh, the most uh, obvious uh, thing that uh, Fancy provides is uh, sequences and uh, collections utilities. And uh, this is uh, the thing people use the most. Because, because uh, you don't uh, need to get functional programming and stuff to use it. I already uh, talked a bit about it. Then uh, Fancy has uh, some extension on Funk tools, I guess, with uh, patials, uh, write patials, carrying, and uh, composition, and some other thing, things. And uh, then uh, just uh, some utilities for Lots of things like string utilities. Uh, the p one example is uh, that I always hated how you need to first in Python first match a thing with a regular expression and then write if it matched, then go with uh, you. Know, it's like you always need at least three lines of code to use a regular expression. And uh, I came before Python. I wrote Perl a lot, and it's uh, much easier there. And uh, usually, it's one line. So I added some uh, things to work with regular expressions. Uh, when some uh, flow control utilities and some primitives, and ironically, even some utilities for you to use with objects like cached property. Uh, we, we now also have this uh, cached property in uh, Django, I believe from 1.6. And uh, this is uh, really handy when you have these uh, objects like ORM objects and uh, you need some properties that shouldn't be calculated twice for, for an instance. And uh, when uh, there is a debug debugging utilities for functional programming, because uh, when you debug a functional program, you sometimes uh, can't go uh, the way you usually do. You can't uh, add print uh, because you everything is happening on a single line, and or you can't uh, use watches because uh, and stepping because. Uh, there are far less uh, named variables. You just pass everything to every one, one function to other function and like that. So it uh, has some debugging utilities like uh, decorators, logging and printing and timing and things like that. 
Uh, yeah, so PyTools, that's T-O-O-L-Z, is a collection of functions um, that are good for managing iterators and functions and dictionaries. Uh, these functions are, are pure, composable, lazy, and tuned. Um, and they sort of follow the standard functions you'll find in a variety of languages. So if you look at languages like Clojure or Scala or in JavaScript, libraries like underscore or Lodash um, or a variety of other languages in Ruby and whatnot, uh, you'll find that uh, there's a bunch of functions that work on iterators, things like map and filter, but there's, there's far more, like group by and uh, sliding window and repeat uh, and memoize and curry. Um, and you'll find these functions all over the place. And they end up being really useful when you build an ecosystem based on core data structures. So earlier in the show, we were talking about the value of just dealing with lists and dictionaries and iterators and normal functions and how this is really good for an ecosystem. And once you start to uh, use only these core data structures, you find there's actually a lot of functions you often want. Uh, and they're just, they're just not in the Python standard library, but they are in lots of other standard libraries. Uh, and so a lot of other languages sort of converge to this common, this common function set and tools was just the instantiation of that common function set in Python. Uh, you asked about how these libraries might relate to each other if they're different, whatever you use both in the same, same project. Uh, I think that they probably overlap enough that it's not usually necessary to use them in the same project. But they're also both simple enough that you could. They're both very lightweight dependencies. I would say that tools is uh, notable uh, compared to the, all the other functional libraries uh, in that it's very low tech. It's usually just functions. Um, uh, and it's also, so it, it's very accessible. Uh, you shouldn't ever need to learn some new concept. The same with Funcy. Um, it's also notable in his performance. Uh, tools has been heavily benchmarked, uh, largely thanks to Eric Welch, uh, who does most maintenance today. Uh, and Eric also rewrote PyTools in Cython, uh, which makes the, all the iterator stuff uh, about as fast as you'd find in a compiled language like Java uh, on dynamic data structures. Um, so Tools is intended to be sort of uh, very much like what you expect if you're familiar with other languages and it's uh, very fast. Hmm. Well, one thing that uh, you, well, one obvious difference that, uh, is that you use uh, the iterator, iterator versions of all the functions. But ah, uh, that's true. yeah, the fancy is a bit different. Uh, it, uh, first, it has two versions uh, for many functions, like a list version and an iterator version. And uh, they are named differently for Python 2 and for Python 3. In Python 2, uh, it's like, uh, start if it starts with i, then it's iterator version, like map and imap. And uh, for Python 3, it's like map and lmap. So uh, in uh, Python 3, by default, you don't have a list version of map and field and like that. And, I don't uh, really like this change because uh, this is uh, so confusing for many people. Uh, you you like call this map or filter and uh, you, it uh, does not actually do uh, the, the job. You pass this iterator and uh, then later you can uh, get something from it. And uh, you can... Uh, uh, forget that it's iterator. You can try to add it to a list, or you can try to iterate it uh, twice, which gives you an error in a different uh, uh, in a different uh, point when uh, you actually get this error when you actually made it. So I should not. I don't think uh, uh, the iterator should go by default. This, for me, it's uh, more like an optimization. So the Python 2 way of uh, doing things uh, makes more sense to me. Right, so this is actually, this, this difference, so you're right, so everything in tools where possible is an iterator, uh, even in Python 2. So if you import map from tools in Python 2, you'll get uh, the equivalent of iter tools imap. Um, um, and this is this is by design for two reasons. Uh, one, uh, tools is one of the uh, desires here is that tools should be minimally creative. Uh, we didn't want to design an API or make those decisions. Uh, the core Python library, core Python language, is going lazy. We decided to go lazy too. Uh, and second, this also probably comes down to uh, 
our backgrounds. Um, in web programming, I suspect that many times you want map, you actually have a small data set, and you, you want that to be a list in memory. Uh, where for me, I do a lot of data processing, and for me, it's very valuable to have everything be lazy by default. I can stream through tens of gigabytes from disk on my machine uh, and be very happy, and tools just works in a small space. Um, but that, I, I, I agree with you that in many cases, when I do work on you know, just very small lists of five elements, I really do find writing list, you know, list map sequence uh, to be very annoying all the time. Still, I see this uh, using iterators uh, as an uh, optimization. So it should not go by default. And, uh, this way, I don't agree how Python free map and filter does things. And, uh, so you, you should go with lists by default. And if it's too slow or too memory consuming, then you switch to iterators. Uh, so like uh, premature optimization. And uh, Python 3 forces you into it. And uh, iterators way are inherently more complex than lists. They are more hard to handle. So you write a more harder to, to handle code by default. And uh, this is wrong. Uh, it's also very useful sometimes, though. I think if the whole community gets on board, with the concept of lazy iterators, uh, then the whole ecosystem is lazy by default. And that, that has a lot of value, again, when you're, when you're processing data, uh, which for me is the common case. Again, I think this is a difference between the web community and the science community, uh, where uh, it might be an optimization, but it's an optimization we want almost all the time. And it's, it is quite tricky to make sure that uh, all the libraries you're using everywhere are being lazy by default. Um, that it becomes it's sort of very easy in your own code just to use lists, but if you're writing infrastructural code, code that's going to be used by many different projects at the same time, uh, you sort of want to be lazy by default, because a lot of those users, again in my community, want the laziness. It's of high value. But we can disagree. That's 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 fine. And so, what inspired each of you to create your libraries? Uh, I started from writing some data utilities and functional utilities. Uh, it was a, a part of a, a part of a web application. Uh, only later I extracted uh, it; just grew this part uh, over time. And then I extracted it into a library, and it was obviously very uh, limited in. in in, a, in its scope, because uh, I only added uh, the things that uh, I needed for a project. So it's not like a complete library. So I looked at uh, Clojure standard library, uh, Core library, and uh, uh, on uh, underscore JS library. And uh, I looked carefully what uh, things could be useful in Python. and. Uh, if uh, if I need to change them when I'm moving them to Python. And uh, I implemented all uh, functions from Closure Core, Closure Core library and from underscore JS library, uh, which uh, made sense to, to move. And uh, so uh, Fancy was born. Uh, later, I added some some features that I uh, needed myself, or some features that uh, people asked and, uh, or contributed. Uh, the idea of uh, a library also is that it aims to limit its scope at some point. So, like you add to it, uh, but at some point, it's complete. Uh, nowadays, we usually, <laughs> most projects and libraries were never complete. You like uh, go with new and new versions and you add and add features, but I don't th think it's uh, a good idea for library like this. At some, you need to limit scope at some point and uh, say that this is out of scope, like immutable structures out of fancy scope, definitely. And uh, some other things. And, uh, stop at some point. So, Matthew, 
Uh, yeah, so my experience was very similar. Uh, I was writing a lot of Clojure at the time, and I, I found that what I really liked about the language wasn't any of the fancier features. I just really liked that the whole ecosystem was based on everyone using core data structures. Then again, I talked about you know HTTP requests were just a nested, nested dict. Database connections just took in dictionaries of iterators of dictionaries. Um, and this is I found to be really valuable. And so I took that same thinking into Python, but I found that a lot of the functions that I was used to using weren't present. And so I, again, I looked at Clojure, I looked at underscore, I looked at Ruby's enumerable, um, and I just started implementing them in, in, in tools. Um, and I found that you know it's, it's a really nice approach to use core data structures. And if you have these, a good set of functions, you know, uh, 20 or so functions, that actually encompasses 90% of what you want to do on those data structures from those programs. Uh, and so I was able to lift up my thinking out of for loops, out of maps, to more, um, to more higher level concepts. Um, it was really interesting looking at all these different languages and the set of names that they had converged to, the set of functions. Um, and so it was actually really an easy project to, to build. Uh, all the API was, was set out. Um, actually, so at the time, right after building this, I started working on a few different projects. Uh, it was actually the same algorithm, but in different, different languages. And it was really cool to use Python underscore enclosure and have sort of a, a lingua franca, a common language among all of these different languages where I sort of depend on this API being present. I found that really valuable. Uh, to go with Alexander's uh, point, I think that the scope of these libraries should be small. Um, I uh, Most pull requests a day I, I reject uh, just because they're a little bit weird. Um, I don't think they just stop. I think they should keep growing. I think we're going to keep learning. But um, I think both Tools and Funcy have done a very good job of limiting their scope and of being correct. Uh, you know, there, there are almost no bug fixes. It, it's actually really cool. Uh, and they, they just work and everyone understands and trusts everything in, in the libraries. The reason is that the implementation of many, most of functions is very easy, very simple. Yeah. Sometimes the, it's, uh, it's uh, more complex because you optimize it, but it's still usually very simple. The, the most value is in uh, like concepts and ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that um, it's very simple also because they're communicating off a of very simple shared abstraction. They communicate off of lists or iterators or dicts. Uh, so usually bugs occur in software because we have two things that are independently correct, but when they interact, there's some complex behavior and, and a bug arises. Uh, and so usually a lot of bugs are tracking down, you know, this piece in dinner interact with this widget. Uh, and all of the functions and tools and all the functions in Funcy uh, are completely isolated. And we just trust the underlying Python mechanisms, iterators, dictionaries, et cetera, to be the shared substrate along which they communicate. Uh, which again, that, that lack of interaction really uh, makes developing these libraries uh, a pleasure. And for anybody who isn't aware of it anyway, there's a Funk Tools module in the Python standard library that provides some methods that enable some functional paradigms. I'm wondering where that module falls short and how your respective libraries either augment or replace some of the functionality found therein. Uh, first, uh, Funk Tools is uh, not like a library with an idea. It's like a storage for very loosely connected things which uh, get added into Python uh, over time. Uh, a more interesting one is uh, Iter Tools, which uh, actually has some structure and uh, has uh, some utilities uh, to work with sequences, which are more probably more popular and more known. Uh, if you you speak about Funk Tools, when for example it uh, lacks uh, even compose uh, function composition, uh, probably very basic thing, so it's very easy. Yeah. I'll, I'll agree with Alexander here that I'm looking through the Functools API right now. And the things that I reasonably use are LRU cache in Python 3, partial, single dispatch, and reduce, because it's been sort of evicted from the, the core language. Um, and there's really not a whole lot there otherwise. Uh, things like composition, pipe, curry uh, aren't present. And these are sort of like standard things you'd expect to be in any functional uh, library. Uh, so it's not really that. It's not. Um, it's really not sort of the the love of of the core developers. Um, I'd also say so. I think Funk tools and Iter tools have a lot of really great functionality in them. But sometimes, so as someone who tries to adhere to standards met by other communities, sometimes they deviate a little bit from 
uh, from common from common interfaces. So, for example, the group by function iter tools is not like the group by function in any other language. It's a it's a false cognate. Um, I think the LRU cache and func tools. I would much rather have seen them accept some mutable mapping as a as an input rather than bake in LRU to the caching mechanism. There are just some ideas that I think it would have been better if the community had looked out to what other languages have been doing for these exact same concepts and taken a little bit more, more inspiration. That being said, I think it's also fine. I think that a lot of this code shouldn't be in the standard library. It should be in third-party libraries. You know, packaging is good enough now that you know, Funsy or Tools or FunPy can just be the standard functional programming library for Python. It doesn't really need to be baked in. Yeah, that was one thing I was going to ask about is whether you thought it would be useful or something that you would consider pushing for to try and get you know, some or all of or at least some small portions of some of these other functional languages baked into the standard library to either augment or replace the existing func tools. But I also know that there's a... Uh, common meme that the standard library is where modules go to die because it's a much slower rate of change and it's not as easy to introduce updates or modifications to those modules once they do become part of the standard lib. I think uh, now that we have uh, better packaging tools, like uh, they're still imperfect, but uh, they're better. Uh, it uh, makes less sense to keep a big standard library library so we, we have obvious uh, things uh, like requests which is far better than built-in uh, rule lib and rule lib 2 or or even uh, slightly fix, fixed fixed rule lib in python 3 uh, but still we don't have this uh, request in the standard library and i think it's okay the main and the main reason is this uh, better packaging tools and uh, this uh, situation permits a uh, each uh, project uh, to develop separately and usually faster. We can see how even better packaging tools like in uh, Node.js community, they lead to like lots of lots of packages and uh, they lead to smaller packages. So the better your packaging tools, the more and the smaller packages you have and uh, they develop the faster way. We don't need uh, to keep uh, everything in standard library at, at this stage. Yeah, I, I agree. I think um, the only the only value that it would serve, I think, is the value of social proofing. That okay, here's something that a you know an external authority has sort of declared as good. But I think we've we've handled social proofing through things like GitHub stars. You know, both Funcy and Tools are well downloaded. They're they have lots of stars. We both publish continuous integration tests, and that's sort of enough to convince people that they're they're worth worth doing. Uh, the other value would be with distribution. But I think I mean at least in the scientific world. You know, sort of the you know Anaconda distribution, and I'm you know grain of salt. I work for this company, but the Anaconda distribution has, has become sort of a de facto standard among numeric developers. And you know, requests is there. All of the libraries that you sort of think of as being standard are are distributed along with what people download when they install Python, and you can you can trust that it will be on the user's machine. You guys have mentioned it a couple of times, the uh, fn.py library, and I'm wondering if you guys can compare and contrast that with your own work, or if it makes sense to dig into that further. Uh, if, if you don't think it makes sense to dig into that further, then I'm happy moving on to the next question. I looked at it and I uh, read the uh, code of it, and uh, it's an interesting library, but I think of it more uh, like a research project, not some uh, practical tool. It's a bit like Haskell, <laughs> and uh, it has uh, many interesting uh, things in it, and uh, this is why I re read its, its code, but uh, I never even tried to use uh, it uh, in, uh, in any real code. I think that fn.py is a really cool project. Um, it has actually a lot of really cool stuff in it, like persistent data structures, a lot of neat syntax tricks to make pretty lambdas and streams. Um, there's sort of very clearly some heavy sort of scholar or Haskell uh, influence in it. Um, I would say that uh, it differs from the two products we've written and that its, it's scope is much, much larger. Uh, so it's, it's encompassing lots of fun ideas inside functional programming, where fun CN tools are both sort of restricting themselves to what is clearly pragmatic, clearly Pythonic, and you can sort of insert into a workplace without trumpeting the sort of functional programming idea. But I think that for the conversation, we should probably have Alexi here, uh, and that's, uh, that's not present. 
And so there are a number of concepts involved in functional programming, such as currying, function composition, immutable data, and pure functions. And we've covered a number of those, but uh, for any of them that we didn't cover, can you describe some of those concepts and explain any that you uh, tried to incorporate into your libraries if we haven't already covered them? I tried to incorporate uh, some practical and useful tools. And uh, still I have things like uh, function composition. And I have even uh, helpers for immutable data to use uh, common collections like dicts uh, as uh, immutable by convention collections uh, which <laughs> I a bit doubt is useful but but still so my approach not like adding more concepts in the library it's, I don't he think I have uh, much more than those when current composition maybe partials and uh, a bit immutable data help, help us that's it so I'll say a few things. So uh, like Alexander, uh, tools has sort of the basic pure things, pure functions, core data structures, function composition, iterators. But some of the concepts we haven't talked about are present not in our libraries, but in other libraries that are accessible in the Python ecosystem. So I'll talk about those for a little for a moment. Um, there's things like dispatch. There's single dispatch and func tools. I, there's a library called multiple dispatch that I also wrote that does um, allows you to dispatch a function based on all the types of all the arguments. Uh, which can be handy to write some uh, generic functions. Uh, there's things like macros. So a macro is something like a function which gets its full input unevaluated. So for example, if I call a function f on the input 1 plus 2, the function doesn't get 1 plus 2, it gets the evaluated result 3. So when I go into the function call f, I get the value 3, and f can work on 3. Uh, macros actually give the unevaluated result 1 plus 2 as like an abstract syntax tree to the function. Uh, and this can be useful if you want to say, make a nice plot function. You want the user to say, you know, plot x equals y squared. And you actually want to have uh, that full expression being handed to the, the macro uh, without being evaluated ahead of time. Uh, sort of the common use case here is uh, the assert statement in Python. So with assert, we say assert x equals y. Uh, and assert gets true or false, and if it's true, then it does nothing if it's false it raises an error but if it's false and it raises an error we actually want to sh give a good error message to the user uh, and we want to you know say you know x you know x which is, happens to have the value three doesn't equal y which happens to have the value seven uh, and we've sort of gotten around this in very hacky ways if you look at the project pytest pytest actually compiles your code a little bit to do this for you uh, there's a really cool project called code transformer by joe jevnik and scott sanderson uh, that does a lot of sort of compilation of, of Python functions in a really cool way. Uh, it's, you know, I'd never use it pragmatically, but it's, it's very neat. It's worth looking at. Uh, there's things like immutable data structures with persistence and structural sharing. This is another concept. So if I have, uh, say, some, some data structure like a dict, and I want to change some element of it, but uh, I've already handed that dict, dict off to some other process running some other thread or some other coroutine, uh, I want to make sure that that other user of that data doesn't see my change result. So in Python currently, I'd have to make a copy. Uh, so this, is, this is what Alexander was talking about, immutable by convention. But if it's, it's possible with sort of very fancy underlying data structures to make a slight copy of a data structure like a dict or a list that uh, even though logically they're completely separate, these two copies, one slightly changed, uh, in memory, they actually share a lot of the same structure. So this is persistent data structures with structural sharing. Uh, there's a project by Kurt Smith called Ozymandias, which is sort of new and, and rocky, but it does this on the C level, so it's, it's, it's quite fast. There's general thinking about types, uh, and there's, again, some nice work from the, the core language team to think about you know, adding function annotations into Python 3. There's a whole types module that allows you to spell interesting types. So there's some, some interesting work happening there as well. So just to be clear, there's lots of functional programming happening in Python, and what Alexander and I have done is just sort of a small part of it. There's lots of other libraries to look at. Maybe not a concept, but, but another touch on uh, functional programming thing that you can do in Python is uh, like utilities to to uh, abstract away flow control. And uh, in Fancy, I have some of those, uh, like, and uh, some for handling errors and uh, some for like making the retry, so things like that. I also have some backports from Python 3. Like in Python 3.4, we have uh, this uh, suppress context manager. Like you, like we've suppressed some 
exception and a block which uh, ignores this exception. You can write it in Python too also, and <laughs> so I back post and uh, edit a few other things uh, like this to fancy. And uh, about uh, immutable date, uh, it's uh, like if you have them uh, by default, like in closure, in all where all your collections are by default uh, are immutable and they share structure. Uh, this is a very different thing when when you have this immutable collections as a separate library. Because uh, in this uh, situation, when they are separate library, it's uh, a very special purpose tool which a uh, very small amount of people will use. And uh, I think uh, in, in Python it uh, will be like that. Uh, that's true, but I would, I would suggest that as long as we adhere to some of the interfaces, like mutable mapping or immutable mapping, uh, we can pass these things around and get some more coverage. So for example, I think that Python has actually done a really good job about having some shared interfaces, like the file interface, the underscore iter interface. In the scientific world, we've got the array interface. Uh, and these allow a lot of more custom applications. So many people have written array libraries. And they can all interoperate because they all use these, these shared protocols. And so I think that with things like immutable data structures, the sort of hook into the general ecosystem is going to be with those shared protocols. They're going to implement mutable mapping. They're going to implement sequence. Mm -hmm. I agree. It's, uh, protocols in, in Python were very beneficial. Uh, we were recently with a uh, big thing in uh, Clojure called uh, Transducers. And mm -hmm. uh, when people started to make their own Transducers in uh, all sorts of languages, and uh, this includes Python. So there are probably several implementations of uh, that for Python. And then if you look a bit closer, to it, it uh, does not actually make uh, much sense for Python because uh, transducers for closure they solve the, the, they solve the problem that uh, Python uh, had solved years ago with uh, iterator protocol and with uh, things like that. So uh, iter protocols like iterator protocols and uh, abstract uh, base classes like sequence they help a lot. I agree. And so what are some of the resources that you guys have found to be most helpful when trying to learn and apply different functional paradigms to your programs? Uh, I'm in a way self-taught programmer, so <laughs> I just try things. But there, there are probably this uh, talk by Rich Hickey called Simple Made Easy, uh, which uh, advocates uh, the using data instead of classes and generally simpler things, like uh, things with uh, with us less amount of paths. Not sure if you heard it, but <laughs> you probably should. I've heard of it a few times, but I haven't yet watched it, so I'll definitely take some time to do that. Yeah, it's only a half an hour and it's really good. Rich Higgy has other good uh, uh, talks and uh, many of them are very, very opinionated. Like uh, he advocates things that he uh, does in closure. And uh, for Many languages with things they don't make uh, that much sense or don't make sense at all. But uh, still, uh, they're usually interesting. But but if I chose the single pin, uh, single talk about functional programming, this will be this uh, simple made easy. It's also very interesting to look at uh, functional programming languages and uh, at the standard libraries like uh, Clojure and Haskell and ML, different sorts of ML. So these are my sources. Yeah, I'll definitely repeat the suggestion for Simple Made Easy. I think it's a great talk. I've, I, I watch it every once in a while, honestly. It's a little shameful, but it's a great talk. Uh, Rich Hickey is a great speaker, or he's a very opinionated speaker, and he distills his ideas very well. Uh, whether you, know, you agree with him or not, up, up to you. But Simple Made Easy is certainly, um, certainly worth reading. Uh, I, would, I would also like to repeat, uh, I would say language tutorials. I would say that in the last few years, there's been a, a good surge to increase the friendliness of languages, um, uh, especially in the functional space. And so, you know, those things like learn you a Haskell, there's probably learn you an Erlang or something. Um, I would generally encourage uh, anyone who's interested in programming to gain a little bit of exposure to a lot of languages. Uh, and this really helps you to understand much more about your own language. Just how when you learn a second natural language, like if, you're, if you speak English and you learn French, it teaches you a lot more about the structure of language. Um, so you're not necessarily learning these languages to use them, but it's nice to learn Go and see how that affects you know, how you might use Tornado or AsyncIO inside of Python. Actually, in my most recent project, I was using 
uh, concurrent programming a lot, I sort of settled on Tornado. And before that, I read lots of talks on Go, or I listened to lots of talks on Go. I uh, read all of the Clojure Core Async documentation. I read the Async I.O. documentation. Um, and really by exposing yourself to a, a broad set of ideas from a BOD community, you really become, a, I think, a much more well-informed programmer. So learn functional programming from many different languages, but come back home and write fairly normal Python, just slightly, slightly different. If you are learning languages for concepts, then uh, I think it's uh, better to find uh, the least, uh, least uh, familiar language and with a different paradigm. Like uh, you, it's enough to learn like some Lisp and some ML for, for functional programming. And then you better go with uh, some logical programming. And uh, then something like stack-based, like FOF, this uh, will benefit you more than learning two ML type languages or two Lisps. This is a, a bit of a side from functional programming, but it's more like in, in the learning concepts. Yeah, I can definitely agree that learning different languages of the same general family aren't necessarily going to give you any new... They, they may give you some new ideas, but they're not going to give you any new concepts or uh, drastically improve your worldview when it comes to programming. So, for instance, I've had experience in programming both Ruby and Python, and they're both pretty familiar once you've started to learn one of them, but I've started delving a little bit into the Elixir and Erlang languages, and that's definitely a extreme paradigm shift, so it's not as uh, easy to pick them up because of some of the functional concepts involved. Yeah, I'm quite excited about Elixir, actually. That's, on, that's high on my list to, to find a project to work in. Yeah, agreed. That and Rust are the two, uh, the two biggest ones on my radar at the moment. So uh, is there anything that I didn't ask that you guys think that I should have or anything else that you guys wanted to bring up before we move on? No, I think we've covered it pretty well. Okay, great. Yeah. Can I add a little point to uh, this discussion about languages? Sure. Uh, sometimes, even if you look at language with, which you immediately understand, because it's similar to whatever you know already, it's uh, still beneficial to look through its uh, standard library or some ecosystem or its uh, packaging tools, because uh, this uh, could be different uh, or, or this could be better. So, besides Python, I'm also using Node.js and uh, I look at at uh, this at their package manager npm and uh, look at uh, how they install libraries and how they handle uh, dependencies and uh, it's uh, it has a very significant difference like you in single process you, you can have uh, several several copies of a same library of different versions uh, this makes you go with dependencies uh, entirely entirely other way you have some new problems but you have solved uh, some problems that you have in python and uh, if you say about uh, python and ruby which are some somewhat similar but uh, you can uh, read this uh, like enumerable class and all its methods and uh, it is uh, interesting to read at least first time so I will actually say one thing. Uh, we should probably add a disclaimer that both Alexander and I uh, come from a similar conceptual background. We both largely agree on we both largely agree on things. Uh, and I think if you had another programmer who was say more familiar from the Haskell community, they would have very different opinions. Uh, so uh, one shouldn't take our our words here as being uh, what what functional programmers think. There's lots of functional programmers that would disagree with a lot of what we just said. Functional programming is a very broad uh, very broad term. And a, functional program, a Haskell program would come onto this show and say a completely different set of, of very valid points. I agree. We could have added also some object oriented advocates, like <laughs> coming from Java, or at least from Ruby. <laughs> Although there are a number of functional aspects to Ruby as well, and a, no and a number of people in that community who are embracing some of those functional paradigms, much the same as people in Python are. Absolutely. Functional programming is... Uh, becoming much more hip these days. So for anybody who wants to follow you guys and keep up to date with what you're up to, what would be the best way for them to do that? Uh, Alexander, how about you go first? Uh, I think it's uh, Twitter, uh, Hackflow. And I also have a blog, which I don't write often, <laughs> but still it's uh, hackflow.com. Okay. And Matthew, how about you? 
uh, for me. So my professional website is matthewrocklin.com, M-A-T-T-H-E-W-R-O-C-K-L-I-N.com. You can go to slash blog, and I write fairly regularly there. I just wrote a thing on testing. And there's various links to all the products I work on. Uh, I wrote tools years ago. I started, I and many other people wrote tools years ago, uh, but I work on lots of other projects today. Uh, for tools, you go to tools, T-O-O-L-Z, uh, dot readthedocs.org. Uh, I'm also M. Rocklin at GitHub or Twitter or most things. Great. So with that, I'll move on to the picks. And my pick today is going to be Datadog. It's a software as a service platform that makes it really easy to get up and going with server metrics and has a number of different integrations for being able to get some pretty detailed information out of a number of services you might be using. So for instance, if you're using Mongo or MySQL or Nginx, you can add those integrations and start getting some pretty fine-grained metrics about how those systems are running. Um, that makes it pretty easy to integrate with a pager service, so things like Ops Genie or Victor Ops or PagerDuty, um, as well as your chat tool that you might be using, for instance, HipChat or Slack. So recently added this into the environment of uh, where I just started working because we were using Xenos, which... Well, it's a good tool in its own right. It doesn't seem to handle as well a cloud workload. So Datadog just gave us a really quick and easy way to get some pretty solid metrics up and running and start integrating that with some of the other services that we're using. And with that, I'll pass it to you, Alexander. What do you have for us for picks today? I'll choose a TV show. It's a, an expanse, a sci-fi one, because I I love everything about space. And uh, we don't have uh, my, much TV shows about space now, nowadays. But uh, and uh, this looks good because uh, it's based on a book. It uh, has a solid uh, story. It uh, goes great so far. <laughs> if you want something more practical, then it could be... I can type in this. <laughs> okay. Okay, the more practical thing will, will be uh, the Revolut app. It's uh, an app which uh, sends you a bank card, which works in uh, every country without uh, any uh, fees in bank amounts and uh, translates money at the best uh, cost, you, at best rate you can achieve. Uh, <laughs> I've been uh, traveling last month and intend to travel one month more, so it's very handy for me. Yeah, so I've got uh, three picks. Uh, first is a library that I ran into just last week on a tools issue. It's Riemann, R-I-E-M-A-N-N. -N. This is a, a closure library, uh, so sort of in, inside the same theme. Um, for They've got a really nice stream abstraction, and it's for monitoring distributed systems. Uh, if you go to that page, riemann.io, there's a, there's a video on the front uh, that I really enjoyed. So if you're done watching this podcast, and you're interested in some of these ideas, it's nice seeing some of those ideas in practice in sort of real concrete problems. It's a, it's, a nice, it's a nice video. Yeah, that's a project that I've been keeping a close eye on myself with the intent of putting that into the infrastructures that I've worked on. I have not yet had the opportunity to, to do so. I'll second that recommendation wholeheartedly. Yeah, I just learned about it last week. I thought it was really cool. Uh, the second one, more of a sort of a humanities pick, uh, it was a movie Five Dances. I think it's like a, an independent film. Um, and if you're into dance or sort of human movement, it's, it's really cool. Um, I think in the first five minutes, you'll figure out if you love it or hate it. Um, but it's just it's a bunch of dancers. There's a little bit of plot, but it's mostly them uh, in, a, in a practice room going around. Uh, so I think it's really cool, but again, it's not for everyone. Uh, the third third pick is actually a little bit self-serving. What I've been working on for the last few months is a project called Distributed, uh, which is a dynamic task scheduler, so something like Make, uh, but for sort of data science analytic operations. Uh, and it's on uh, distributed systems uh, using the concurrent futures interface. So if you like concurrent futures, but you want to use a full cluster, uh, check out Distributed. Uh, again, it's sort of new. It's in beta, but I'd love to have some feedback on it, especially from uh, your, your, your viewership. So that's it. I was also going to recommend Hi, but we also mentioned that earlier on in the show. So Very cool. Well, thank you both for taking the time out of your day to join us and talk about functional programming and your work on some libraries to make that easier to do in Python. And thank you for having us. This is really fun. Yeah. Thank you, too. All right. Adios. Bye. Bye. Bye.